poi il disco va. Aspettiamo un attimo Delia. Vuole acqua, dai, Niente. vecchia? No, sì, un po'. Ma lui lo sa che io faccio solamente i saluti sì. e scappo. Eh, certo. Ah, sì. Questo non lo saprei mai. No? Non lo saprei Perciò mai. non lo sapevo. Good morning to everybody. We can start uh, this uh, interesting conference. Uh, I'm Maria Laura Corrente, as uh, some of us <laughs> already know me. And I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, our, um, the, the person who will take the lecture in this uh, conference. Um, I introduce uh, uh, Professor Sunchitsa Bozak from the University of Zagreb in Croatia. Uh, I suppose that our director will be something about uh, her. Um, Dr. Adriana Trotta, who is a PhD student, and then uh, Professor Delia Franchini from the Sitartor Clinic of the department. Before starting, I invite uh, our head of the department uh, for greetings, Professor Domenico Otent, and then uh, Professor Domenico Buonavoglia, who is the head of our uh, School of Post-Graduation. Please, Domenico, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I didn't know that we had to speak, uh, we are supposed to talk in uh, English. So it's Maybe. <laughs> we, we have <laughs> it's fine, I, even if I think that uh, that's uh, uh, just for introduction of uh, our uh, host uh, and uh, uh, dear guest, uh, Suncisa Bosak, who is at the Department of Biology in Zagreb, Croatia. And um, mm, I'm, uh, I'm really happy to welcome all of you in the uh, campus of uh, veterinary medicine here, where uh, we are working since long time on uh, these on different aspects of uh, the sea turtle hosp of the sea of the sea uh, of sea uh, head legged uh, turtle, and uh, uh, today we will talk about uh, uh, the uh, microbiome and different aspects linked to the microbiology of uh, uh, these uh, uh, turtle of uh, these turtles, which as you know, are very important uh, for the biodiversity in our, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in our uh, Mediterranean Sea. And uh, we, we have been working with different aspects of these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, wildlife, wild uh, uh, animal. So, um, uh, the, the first, uh, uh, we, we have also uh, a, a talk about uh, the uh, surgical aspects uh, of uh, surgical uh, issues linked with uh, the rescue of, uh, of uh, these uh, turtles uh, by uh, uh, Delia Franchini, who is uh, with uh, Lello Di Bello, uh, working with, who, who has been working for a long time in the Sea Turtle Clinic uh, at the Department of Veterinary Medicine. And, um, that will be a good uh, opportunity for all of us uh, to discuss about uh, the many aspects uh, of uh, this, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of the problems linked with uh, uh, the uh, conservation uh, of these, uh, of these uh, 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 reptiles. Uh, I would like also to remind all of you that we have another project, the Adrenet project, with uh, the uh, food hygiene within the food hygiene unit, uh, which aims uh, to preserve biodiversity and coastal ecosystem of the program region, 
and to improve management of the marine resources while combating, while combining, combining the efforts of scientists, fishermen and citizens on the, these three countries which are involved in this interreg project, which are Italy, Albania and Montenegro. Uh, I think that uh, uh, that's it. Uh, welcome again uh, to the Department of Veterinary Medicine and enjoy the talks uh, and the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Domenico, and thank you also to Domenico Bonavoglia for your for his presence. Uh, as we have, uh, we are in delay. I suppose we can start with the first lecture. First lecture with uh, Sanchez Bozak, uh, who will present uh, a lecture about Tartar Biome Project in site into endozoic and epizoic microbial communities of Logger at the Sea Turtles. Uh, Sanchez Bozak. Uh, works in uh, the University of Zagreb. We first met in a Skype conference, a Skype conversation, and when we first met, uh, I, mm, I thought uh, that uh, if you have to describe it with just a word, this word is volcano. <laughs> she is a volcano, our idea, and so on. So I'm sure that uh, her lecture will be an eruption. Thank you, Sanchez. Okay. Okay. Now it's on. Uh, I will be. I will try to be as energetic as possible, but I'm a little bit limited because I have to stand near the microphone. <laughs> I usually walk and talk a lot, but um, and I talk really loud. So I hope you all be <laughs> hearing me if I tend to step out from this range. So thank you for the invitation, and it's a really incredible opportunity for me to be here. Because, um, first of all, I am a biologist. I work at the Department of, Bio of uh, Biology and um, I have a PhD in, in oceanology. And um, I've been working with uh, phytoplankton mostly uh, throughout my career. And um, recently, uh, two years ago, let's say, I got involved with um, sea turtles. And uh, how everything got uh, connected uh, during the research career, and um, you will see during the, uh, you will hear and see during this uh, lecture. So I called the, the lecture the Sea Turtle Hollow Beyond because I was aware that I'm, uh, I, I arrived to a place where you are veterinary medicine mostly, and. Uh, for uh, to understand about the holobiont concept and about the organism concept nowadays that we study in biology, it's important for me to introduce you to the basic uh, principles that are in, let's say, this part of the science now. So the, uh, the aim is to describe and to talk about the microbiota. We use the term microbiome, and uh, the title of my project uh, um, that I'm here with, uh, that Adriana, that will talk after me, was is collaborating, um, is the microbiome of the sea turtles. But it's not actually the good word. When I wrote the project and I put that name, I didn't, I wasn't aware that the microbiota is the better term because microbiota is the community of the microorganisms, is not just the genes. Because when we talk about the microbiome, we actually talk about the genes that are in those microorganisms. So um, as I'm sure that most of you are aware of, we are not a single organism. We are a community, um, not just humans, but all the animals and all the plants and all the single-celled organisms that we all live in the communities. All eukaryotic organisms are actually the community because they have symbionts. We have mitochondria, plants have chloroplast that are derived from the bacteria. So we are all the communities. But um, in recent years, we became aware that we cannot treat a single organism as an organism because we are super organisms. We are in continuous interaction with our <laughs> societies, with our communities that live on and inside of us. The, well, everything that we know 
came, of course, um, most, of it, most of the research uh, is based on humans. And there was this uh, awareness relatively recently, of, let's say maybe 10, 20 years ago, that we as humans contain more uh, microbial cells than our own cells. First estimates were wrong, <laughs> but they're still very cited that we contained uh, more than 10 times of bacterial cells than human cells. It was a kind of, uh, let's say, misleading interpretation of a number of bacteria that can be found in our, um, in our body, in our feces. But uh, the proper estimation now, it's more closer, ratio, it's closer one to one, but it's still a lot. We have, so we as, a, as a beings, as a organisms, we have the same amount, the same uh, quantity of the cells as we have the bacteria and all the microorganisms that live within us and on us. So there are important. In these uh, terms, when we, when we started the research of the microbiome and of the microorganisms, we conducted in research this term, uh, we conducted the term holobiont. Holobiont is the host and all the associated communities. And um, these are the viruses, bacteria, archaea, fungi, protists. But the holobiont and describes so more than an organism in the terms of evolutionary and also ecological perspective. It's very important because when we study uh, individual, micro, uh, individual organisms, we tend to forget that it's actually a community. And we need to do that because we evolve as a host genome together with the microbiome, so the whole, all genes that are connected with our uh, system, we evolve as a single unit. So the, the term hologenome and holobiont are nowadays widely used in uh, terms of research and also evolutionary perspectives. You as a vet know that because all the ruminants, they, they cannot uh, digest their food without microorganisms. So the cows cannot uh, digest the food without the rumen, without all the microorganisms that live inside of the, of the gut. And it's impossible also for the termites to have this, all the communities and also to digest the food. And it's not just the digesting of the food. So these animals evolved throughout the time with this, uh, with their host, the host evolved throughout the time with their communities of the microorganisms and they couldn't achieve their, um, their state, they couldn't achieve their uh, populations in, without their microorganisms. So um, also the immunological perspective is very important uh, to, to think about in terms of the holobiont, so when we use. So it's, it's not something that is, um, we know about the termites a long time ago. We know about the cows, how they have the microorganisms in their guts. But micro, microbiome studies have been hot topic just last few years, maybe 10 years. It's really recent. Why is that? Because we weren't actually uh, aware how, much, how many organisms, microorganisms are there. I teach microbial ecology in the university and uh, this is something that like it's very hard to teach from a textbook because every year, every month there are new discoveries, new stuff that are published in the papers. No textbook can keep the pace with the, with the discoveries of the microbiome on, on, on the microorganisms research. Um, we knew before all the, th all the stuff about microbiology from the microorganisms that we grow in the lab. We still do that. It's, you cannot change, I mean, that uh, knowledge when you have something that grows in your petri dish and then you can test it and do whatever you want. But the truth is that most of the biodiversity is not culturable. And um, this was discovered and it's called like the great plate count anomaly. When the scientists took the same sample from the environment, they put a piece of a subsample to a petri dish, just one colony grew. And when the same sample is put under the microscope, dyed with some color and, uh, and checked how many bacteria are there, they found more than 100 times more bacteria in the microscope. So 
we now know that not more than 0.01% uh, of the microorganisms, for instance, in the sea from the marine environment, is possible to culture to have it in the lab. And we need to study that. So that was the, the, um, the obstacle of studying those unculturable organisms was the development of technology. So the, the, the technology that we had 20 years ago wasn't, or 30 years ago, wasn't able to do to discover the microbiome, the genes, everything that is out there. Now we have uh, developed in the last few years next generation sequencing techniques. So these are methods and high throughput methods. We can determine uh, just from a piece of uh, sample from the environment how many uh, bacteria are there, what are they, so uh, what is out there, how they are doing it by studying the tra transcriptomics for instance, what are they doing by studying the functional genes. So we don't need actually the samples in the lab to be able to study the microorganisms and their environment, what they do in their environment. The High throughput techniques also found out <laughs> that uh, the tree of life is much uh, com more complicated than we thought before. The new tree of life is valid from 2016 and uh, this discovered a completely new world of bacteria. Bacteria are much more diverse than we thought before. They, you see the red dots? These are all not species. These are completely clades, new clades, novel clades that are not possible to culture in the lab. There is no way to study them without uh, high throughput sequencing and also all these new generation sequencing techniques. So, and we know they're out there and the same is valid for the eukaryotes. Eukaryotic tree is huge, much more complex than we thought before. So we are discovering uh, enormous diversity of the microbiota over the, uh, everywhere, not just connected with uh, certain organisms, but everywhere in every type of environment that we sample and that we study. But what can we use this knowledge for? So it's nice, okay, we, we describe a very beautiful, diverse uh, bacteria, world of bacteria, we get them, you know, new names and we are very happy <laughs> that we discovered this, something unknown. But uh, how is that important for their hosts? As I said um, previously, everything that we know is because it's connected to humans and uh, when something is connected with uh, human research, of course, it's well funded. <laughs> and uh, it has been funded through the last 10 years uh, through sev several big, really large um, projects. For instance, in USA, the Human Microbiome Project has spent, as you can read, a little bit less than $2 billion of dollars on research that is connected with the microbiome. So it has to be something, you know, of importance if uh, countries are uh, spending actually so much money on the research on something that is, uh, that is connected with the micro microbiome. And um, it was something that it was discovered for, the, for this well-funded uh, project is that we have the first thing it was described what is living on us and in us. Okay, that's fine. But then the second part, the second phase is how it's connected to the most, well, some of the important uh, problems, some important diseases, for instance, in uh, diabetes and uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And now we have uh, humans, we have developed uh, drugs well, it's not drugs, it's a treatment with bacteria that actually can help uh, patients and people who had problems with uh, inflammatory uh, bowel disease, for instance. This is one of the most important research. What is also discovered that, uh, and has been largely studied, that the microbiome develops from birth and it's actually influenced pre-birth in, in the placenta, the, uh, the humans get the first introduction to the microbiome and uh, the composition changes during the age. 
it's influenced by the environment, it's influenced by the food, but it's also influenced by all this stuff that is around the environment, bad stuff like the antibiotics and uh, everything that also Adriana will talk about, all the problems with the antibiotic resistance and so on. But um, so we know that in humans, microorganisms really change a lot uh, in, our, uh, in our health and they're really important. Um, also, one important, uh, let's say, result is that every individual has a different, unique microbiome. So, we have different uh, DNA and we can uh, distinguish between ourselves on the basis of the DNA, but we also have a microbial fingerprint. And uh, we can share our microbial fingerprint by, for instance, living together, <laughs> eating the same food. So it's like this extension of us, not just uh, the beings, but all of our communities that live um, with us. So every individual is a unique. And um, animal microbiome has been largely studied, but um, I can say when I was trying to research what is uh, the available amount of uh, papers on the animals, especially wild animals, it's less. So um, not so much because, I mean, obviously you need uh, funds and you need researchers that are interested in several, you know, this uh, unique and uh, who wants to study a careta careta microbiome, for instance? And this is the question that is like, okay, why should I study something from a wild animal that most of the people don't see ever in their life and it's not absolutely of the importance in their life? So um, it happens also with the other animals. And um, some of the research of the animal microbiome is very, um, limited to the, for instance, this, uh, this study in Komodo dragons, it's limited to the closed environments and uh, to see how the microbiome is influenced by the holding them in captivity, for instance, if it changes, uh, how much it changes with the diet uh, that these animals are fed on and so on. But there are some really cute studies in, uh, in the animal microbiome kingdom. The one of the, let's say, um, common conclusions is that the most uh, influential factor on the animals, as is probably on us, as we are animals, um, is the diet, of course. The microbiome, the microbiota that is living in, the, in our digestive system is influenced by what we eat. So the, um, some of the studies that have been, you know, trying to compile different uh, types of animals, to, uh, knowledge from the research of the different uh, animals, they, they come to the uh, conclusion that the herbivores, of course, have a similar functional guilt. So there are not, uh, evolutionary history determines the prevalence of specific microbial OTUs. So this is like a microbial species but the diet, the diet, of course, primarily selects for the functional guilds. That means the herbivores have a different composition, functional composition of the microorganisms from the omnivores and from the carnivores. And I mean, it was expected <laughs> because it's the, something that is, um, uh, that is logic to us, but still we miss a lot of research to be able to support that hypothesis. Um, animal skin microbiome, something that is also within the project and I was very, uh, I'm quite curious about is what influences the skin microbiome because the skin and the outer surfaces are from um, under different ev evolutionary and ecological pressures than the ones from in the gut, especially if where they live. So what influences, of course, captivity, uh, geography, environment, maternal transfer, and cohabitation. So where these uh, animals live, what is their environment? As um, the topic are the, the topic of this lecture and also the project is, uh, are the loggerheads, so the sea turtles. I tried to find out what is known about marine vertebrates. Okay, microbiome of the marine vertebrates. And um, by marine vertebrates, I mean dolphins, whales, sea snakes, nothing, <laughs> I have to say, uh, crocodiles, just several studies, 
Um, sharks, they are, and there are some very, uh, very cool studies about that. Fish also. Fish have been studied in uh, terms of not just the wild fish microbiome, but it's very important for, for instance, in cages and breeding and, uh, you know, the, to have it, uh, the fish in enclosures, the microbiome can, uh, studies can help to change the diet, for instance, for the animals that are bred in the captivity and uh, try to do in the fish farming, try to raise in the fish farming and so on. But um, from the large animals, there are some really um, interesting and important uh, findings. For instance, there was this uh, skin microbiome study of the humpback whales that determined that actually their skin microbiome is different uh, between the uh, environment where they come from and also they, it changes during the season. It, it was depending in, se in which season they were sampled. And uh, they also tested uh, what is the composition of their m gut microbiome. So, for instance, they found out that these um, this studies in baleen whales that, had, that prey on animals have uh, surprising parallels in functional capaci uh, capacity with, this, uh, terrestri with the microbiome of the terrestrial herbivores, which wasn't expected at all. And uh, there was this study that was um, sampling the microbiome of the whale blow. So basically, it was the um, indication of the whale health. Because whale blow, you know, when the whale comes to the surface, it um, launches the, the, the liquid from their lungs. So basically, it's a seawater, but mixed with a liquid from their lungs, and it's a, base, it's a sample from their lungs. So they were in 2000, I think, uh, 2017, they published this uh, study where they took a drone and they were uh, watching the whales and they took a drone and uh, sampled the, the spray, the whale blow from the whale directly uh, over the surface and they analyzed the microbiome from these samples, so from the drone. And they found out actually that there are core groups residing in the whale uh, lungs. And uh, this is also a way how to, you can, you know, determine the whale's health because if there are some pathogens and so on in that, uh, in that sample. But it's not so easy to sample. I think this is, was the only study that would, you know, go to these uh, samples to have a drone and to be able to catch 25 whales. It's not so simple. Um, about the dolphins, they're much more easy to sample because lots of them are trained. Uh, they found out, uh, you remember the novel tree of the bacteria? So, for instance, in the uh, dolphin mouth, they have found exactly these two types, uh, two bacterial phyla that were uh, discovered uncultured before, and they uh, discovered them in the dolphin mouth that they're completely common there. And uh, also new functional diversity, new CRISPR systems that were found in this, uh, in, the, in, the, in the mouth of dolphins. So that's also something that is connected of why to study microbiome. Because we study microbiome of wild animals to discover something new. And there is a potential everywhere of uh, not just to dig out to the stuff that is in our backyard and it's all really, really known, just to go somewhere and to explore something that is unknown, you can discover stuff like a novel systems that can maybe be used in biotechnology and so on. So um, in uh, conclusion for the marine animals, vertebrates, there are just several studies, but even less for sea turtles. So. I found, so there is this study that is connected with the turtle health for this erythmotrellis is very endangered, for instance, and this was the study that um, investigated the connection with the microbiome or with the activity against the Fusarium falciforme, which is a emerging pathogen, pathogen and quite um, destructible for the uh, sea turtle population. So they found out that there are some bacteria on the eggs that can so the microbiota of the eggs can uh, act as like an immune system against the pathogen, uh, certain bacteria that are present on the eggs. So it was 
it's a useful uh, study. And there was just other several studies on Helonia, for instance. They, um, there was a study in, uh, in Florida where they determined that they are shifting their microbiome to the ontogenic shift, which is also expected because youngs are feeding on something, on a different prey than the sub-adult ones, so they change also the composition of the microbiome. About, um, there was also a study about the green turtles, and a first study that came out, it was 2016, so three years ago, uh, on Careta Careta. So the first and until recently the only study that was known from the gut microbiota, so what they have inside, uh, inside their guts. And um, yeah, they, it's just a descriptive study. So basically it just says, okay, these are in the careta careta, the, you have this type of bacteria, this, 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 and that's it. So because they didn't have anything to compare with. And um, r r last year it uh, was published more detailed study uh, on Careta, also from the um, uh, Adriatic Sea. And they, their findings I found really interesting and important because they had the larger sample size, 29. You think it's not a lot, but it is. Um, 29 caretas, and they uh, not just described what is in them, but they compared the um, microbiome composition when the turtles arrived in the center and during the feeding time, so like pre-rehabilitation period and post-rehabilitation period. Before, uh, the only study was that on these uh, green turtles, um, this study from uh, Ahasan et al, uh, they concluded that the gut microbiota changed uh, between pre and post rehabilitation period. But uh, from the study from the Adriatic, it said uh, they actually concluded on a larger uh, sample size and on, uh, let's say, more uh, detailed um, study that the amount of time spent in the rescue center was not correlated to the microbial diversity. And uh, this is something that is people who work with uh, loggerheads, I think it's also intuitive because loggerheads and all the reptiles are very slow. <laughs> Everything is so slower, so it's not immediately uh, changed when you introduce some novel food or something and they're omnivores so they eat everything so the composition didn't uh, ap apparently change and they tested uh, turtles that spent in the in the rescue center for more than 100 days so it's not was like uh, three days and it didn't change so and also the tank water doesn't uh, influence the captive loggerhead microbiota so this study is actually the one that is described something about the endobiotic uh, communities of the uh, of the Careta Careta, and now it comes the project. So uh, I said I my background is in oceanology and uh, general biology, phytoplankton, and uh, lots of uh, stuff connected with the climate change and uh, with the general plants that are living in uh, in our seas, and uh, the topic of the turtle biome got me interested because of the algae, actually, that live on the uh, careta careta. So you can see the main mm, topics in our project, the analysis of the microbiome, so the microbiota, and insight into endozoic and epizoic communities. But the first thing that got me interested was the morphological analysis of the turtle-associated surface biofilms. So, um, we try to, in this project, which will last now for four more years, we will try to describe as much as we can microorganisms that live on the turtles and within the turtles from the Mediterranean. Um, how do we do that? For instance, this is a turtle, Rada, uh, from the center that I will introduce in the next slide. It's, uh, we take samples from the carapax because this is a not, Careta Careta is, has this uh, incredible uh, surface <laughs> for attaching all the organisms. So it's a um, hard surface, so it's like a ship. And it's uh, lots of microorganisms and organisms attach to the carapax because it's a hard surface. But also there are animal, uh, animals, 
and the microorganisms that live on the skin, and these are different communities. So we sample um, both carapax and the skin from each of the sea turtle that we study, and we do the endozoic microbiome. But uh, we don't study, we, did, we don't yet have the fecal samples, but we study the uh, oral and cloacal composition of the communities that reside on the, in, in uh, loggerheads. And we also take control samples, of course, of the biofilm and uh, the pool water to determine what is actually on the turtles and what is in their environment. It's not so, let's say, directed because um, we, as you can see, <laughs> uh, when I started the project, I started it with Aquarium uh, Pula. So this is a small marine turtle rescue center. It's um, several of you have been in visit, I know, but um, it's not a hospital like you have here. So there are no treatments, um, more extensive treatments there. They, um, they have several turtles, but they, we are really, uh, let's say in good collaboration because um, they have, uh, of course, we, they accept all the turtles that are found on the creation site if they are uh, in, the need to be, uh, in need to be treated. So I've been also, thanks to Adriana um, and Maria Laura and everybody, so here, the collaboration with the Sea Turtle Clinic here. Uh, last month, I started the collaboration with uh, Stazione Zoologica with their rehabilitated turtles. Uh, I was there for some time. And uh, from last year, we had also the collaboration and the samples with uh, Archelon. So they are the largest uh, NGO that uh, works with the wild turtles. And uh, we had the uh, agreement, so for several samples from uh, different uh, sites, wild turtles, Mediterranean population that originates of the loggerheads that originates actually, I mean, they're nesting there mostly the ones that are coming to the Adriatic. So it's really imp important and interesting to have it in, uh, in the project. So it, and also live Euro turtles in the Adriatic Sea with the Blue World Institute. When they have the opportunity to tag or to catch some turtles, they also take samples from us. So in the Turtle Biome Project, we try to have not just the rescue center animals, but uh, to study as much as turtles that we can, <laughs> that we can get our hands on actually. And what about this episodic biofilm? So I said, I, um, in, in, in my career, I attached to sea turtles. So I studied the diatoms. These are the organisms, okay, that I live on the turtles and you need a microscope uh, to see them. These are microalgae, so small plants uh, with, uh, if, with the cell case of, made of silica. So they are really uh, interesting and they're primary components of the biofilm that is forming in every surface that is immersed in the water, especially in the marine water, but also in the fresh water. So you can see on the example of this picture of Zhanya, she had a lot of algae on it, but also barnacles. And uh, when I put uh, under the electron microscope, it's uh, carapax, you can see the diversity and you can see the bacteria and all this biofilm that lives on it. So uh, we had uh, the project started last year in May, uh, in so 2018. And uh, during our first year, we sampled Greek turtles and also Adriatic turtles. And these are some kind of first uh, preliminary result that is like, this is a premiere <laughs> of them. And uh, we are going to present them in several conferences during this summer. And uh, I hope you can expect publications in next, um, in next period. So we sampled in this part, we sampled five Greek turtles uh, with uh, just the epizoic stuff, so just the carapax scraping and skip scraping, and we compare them with the Adriatic turtles composition. So you can see just colors here. And uh, from these colors, you, it's obvious that this composition is different from Greece to the Adriatic, but it was expected because it was first different season and this is a different type of environment where, where these uh, loggerheads were caught. So the Greek turtles were caught in Amrikos Bay, Amrakikos Bay, so there were 
in the mud a lot and uh, they were really, really muddy and they had a lot of growth on them. So the prevalence, not the prevalence, but there is a um, presence of uh, anaer anaerobic bacteria from the mud, for instance, on them. And um, this is also true for the Adriatic turtles, but not so much. And um, these are the turtles that were assembled by uh, in here. And also one is, Mary Fisher is from Pula. And uh, we, this, we um, <coughs> investigated four turtles that were sampled in February um, this year. So 16S analysis. Um, it's, uh, I hope that lots of people know what is it. So it's like a barcode for bacteria. So with this high throughput techniques, you have a certain barcode that you can access the identity of the, uh, of this, of the species of the organisms that live there. For the bacteria, it's very simple. You have this 16S, which is present in all the bacteria, and you read the barcode with this very expensive and high throughput machines. You read loads of these barcodes and you know what is uh, the identity of the organism. So this was actually the main uh, tool how we did this uh, analysis. And um, yeah, the, as you can see in the composition, it's, uh, it's pretty much similar between the, um, between the animals and on the skin is different. So the skin composition of the bacteria was is as expected, as we expected, different than the one uh, that we found on the carapax. And uh, to get it in more details, for instance, this is Tarcontes. The result, um, one of the turtles that was uh, caught in uh, beginning of uh, January from um, in trolling and was um, brought to the rescue center in Bari and Adriana and all <laughs> the rest of the people sampled it. So it had a lot of comp uh, composition on the Carapax alpha proteobacteria and 6% of delta proteobacteria. Um, now I go back what is the significance of it. We will see in the next few years because we need to first to define and to see what is there. <laughs> then we will try to compare and then we can maybe try to have some more significant conclusions from what they're doing. So in comparison just with uh, another turtle that was uh, caught a few days afterwards, um, adult female and uh, the, the composition of the Carapax uh, microbiota is a little bit different. It had uh, the most, uh, it had the greater contribution of this flavobacteria. So, uh, this was something that I was interested in and uh, the epizoic uh, microbiome is more uh, related to me. But when I have met Adriana, she and also Maria Laura, they introduced this um, very interesting, let's say, sub-study of lesions that is uh, connected with the bacterial composition of the lesions of the wounds uh, on the skin. And the hypothesis is, of course, that the different uh, microbiome is uh, in the damaged tissues in the, where the turtle has some injuries because it's a completely, let's say, novel surface for the microorganisms. So that's why you have a different rate of colonization on that surface. And it's also you have immune system of the animal that is uh, acting against the pathogens and against the microorganisms that live there. So uh, during the uh, winter, Adriana took uh, 30 turtles sampling the coal, but it, there were four of them that they had uh, the lesions. And unfortunately, because it's science, nothing works as you expected. We have uh, results only from two lesions. Uh, but it's still, we will work on it uh, because I think for me it's something it's, uh, worth of exploring. For instance, two lesions have the uh, large amount uh, detected of Cardiobacterium hominis that is, um, okay, I googled it uh, only. I don't know much about um, all the species of bacteria. I have to search what they're doing. So Cardiobacterium hominis is a prevalent, let's say, pathogen in the human um, diseases. So it's um, basically it was described for the from from human um, from humans, and we found in these wounds we found a lot, and also the sulfovibrio, which is the anaerobic bacterium. What will 
everything will mean and we will connect it with the Adriana research on the antibiotic resistance. So I hope uh, in the next uh, times I will be able to tell you more. But I will finish with diatoms because this is something that is, um, like I said, uh, something that drove my um, attention to the microbiome. So um, diatoms, as I said, are photosynthetic microalgae. They live, as all the algae, on the, on the sea turtles, but they, in the last few years, again, since 2015, uh, my colleagues, uh, which are partners and also collaborators within this project, they um, discovered, reported, unique uh, species that live only on sea turtles. And that actually got me interested. In 2016, I was attending a conference. I was a postdoc trying to figure out what should I do in my research career, trying to, you know, see, okay, I was bored a little bit with phytoplankton. I couldn't find my, my way where to go. Da, da, da. And I listened to that. Um, in that conference, I've met and listened to a great uh, scientist and a great friend. Roxana Majewska, who, disco who discovered and described this unique species, unique genera for the, turtle, for the turtles, found only on sea turtles. And she uh, discovered, not just she, but several other colleagues, described and discovered that these uh, species live not anywhere else, not on whales, not on dolphins, uh, on boats, on uh, rocks, anywhere else in the environment. So this must be a holobiont stuff. So these are species of the microorganisms that co-evolved with the host. And this is, for me, it's really cool to study something that is, okay, I know a lot about diatoms because I was, uh, my PhD was in diatoms. So it seemed like a good idea. And um, as I've met all of these people and started to work that were discovering of the diatoms uh, on all seven turtle species, they are, some of them are unique for the species, apparently, but we still don't know <laughs> uh, so much. The, um, we don't have, for instance, any sample from flatbacks. <laughs> so we have uh, this study that I'm cited it here. They're confirmed on all sea turtles from the museum specimens. So one of the approach that I also have to go to the museum that has preserved uh, carapax, not shiny, polished, but preserved uh, animals and to take uh, samples from the, from the museum, from the dead animals. And you can, I mean, you can see, you don't, sometimes you don't have the genetics, but most of it you can observe it under the microscope because diatoms are really cool. They have this uh, case of silica, like I said, it's basically glass. So you can, they are, forever, <laughs> let's say. And um, so these are the collaborators in the project for the diatoms. And we, uh, we uh, Tom called uh, the diatoms that live on turtles, turtle toms. So we use that term on the description of what we do. And uh, there are people, so Roxana is still working in South Africa. Uh, Bart is a professor in Belgium, and uh, I'm here in the Adriatic Sea. Um, Tom is in, uh, and Matt are working in Florida, and we are sampling turtles, all species, actually. I focused on loggerheads, but we sample all the species from all over the world, and we have uh, constantly discovering every day something new. And, um, and we're trying to do uh, approach not just the uh, morphology, but use the novel se sequencing, generation sequencing. We have a problem with the database, for instance. For the bacteria and for all these um, novel sequencing techniques, it's, for the bacteria it's fine because 16S you have a good database. And for the diatoms, it's still sequences are lacking. It's like you're trying, you have a fingerprints from, I have a, I take a fingerprints from all of you in the audience and I try to find out who you are. It's fine if I have the database, but I don't have a database from all the fingerprints from all of you. So it's doesn't work. I have unknown <laughs> fingerprints. So what we are doing, we are trying to take um, information on the morphology and 
to connect it with the barcode, to take the molecular information on all the species that we can isolate, and we need to isolate because, and it's, uh, we try to identify it in our future research because on the first uh, something that you can see maybe here, yeah, this blue. <laughs> so these are the results from the Qantas skin, for instance, and this blue is unknown diatoms. So yes, great, we have a beautiful novel technology that can, uh, you know, read genes and so on, but we don't know who it's belonging to. I mean, it's identified because we don't have a database. So we are trying to put the names on the species so later on we can know what is this blue <laughs> belonging to. Um, for instance, it will just be published in a few weeks. We have described six new species of the diatoms from different environments, from the loggerheads and also the green turtles, that are, live just on the, the sea turtles, probably. And uh, we have uh, described it only from morphology, but uh, in, um, let's say, we submitted the paper and uh, it got accepted and then we got in, in the culture for instance, so we know the morphology and now we have the sequence and we can, you know, search if this, this species is present in the complete DNA that is extracted from other sea turtles. We don't need to check out all the morphological samples that we have. Uh, one of the things that if I started this talk and if I talked only about the datums, as you can see, I'm more passionate about it, um, it will be the general question for the vets, well, how can they inform on health? Um, we don't know. It's probably, of course, connected with the whole holobiont theory and whole the, let's say, healthy microbiome thing. If you have a healthy microbiota, that biodiversity is high, you are not so prone to infections because you have like a natural barrier of biodiversity that is fighting against the pathogens. So it's probably connected with this. But the results from instance from a study of the diatoms, diatoms don't live just on sea turtles, different species live on other animals. And this was a study from uh, Tom and Matt. They discovered a new species in uh, manatees and it was uh, present only on skin lesions, for instance. So we don't know the significance, but there are some maybe indications that it's uh, connected with this, with the, with the health. But yeah, again. So in the end, I would like to present uh, and thank to the group, which is, Adriana is very important uh, part of, but uh, we are, um, let's say, young group on the um, on university in Zagreb. We have a turtle specialist, that is my colleague and friend Romana uh, Gracian. She studied a lot about turtle biology because I came with like uh, knowledge on diatoms and on the first uh, few months I've been reading books and, uh, and articles about sea turtles and trying to, um, trying to investigate as much as possible. And uh, we have colleagues and friends that uh, a postdoc, uh, Maya that will, and Lovro that do the bioinformatics, two PhD students, uh, Clara and uh, Hervoe, and we call it, and also Lucia and Antonia, two master students. So in all of this, uh, project we are assembling, identifying, we have lots of work and um, I'm really happy that it will last for uh, till 2023 but uh, in this space I'm like now overwhelmed with the data <laughs> so we will, I'm, I hope that I will have in some years um, opportunity to present something that actually uh, is the outcome of the project. Until then, if you are interested, I'm very, um, as uh, Maria Laura said, like energetic. <laughs> um, and I post a lot on social media because it's, uh, I think it's important for not just the funding agency to submit the results, not just the scientific um, community that works with diatoms, okay. I we will publish and we submit our uh, scientific results there, but I think it's also important to connect with uh, turtle biome and turtles are really good um, flagship species for all the problems in the environment, in, especially in the marine environment, plastic pollutions and everything. So I try and we tried to the Facebook and Instagram and Twitter to raise awareness 
on this uh, problem of the conservation of our planet, not just the sea turtles. So if you want, you can follow us and to see uh, what we are doing during um, next years. So I'm done. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm, uh, I'm here, of course, during the discussions. And in the end, I will just show you the beautiful video when Reti, the sea turtle, got, uh, we, when Adriana and all the colleagues here, they took the samples from, from the sea turtles. So one of the, yeah, uh, he, he, he just arrived, <laughs> so it wasn't aware. It seems like she, if she is enjoying, but I'm not sure with the turtles. No, it's, um, yeah, so it's, um, we take as much as non-invasive procedures. Of course, for instance, uh, we had one turtle, Mary Fisher, that was really badly injured in the head. Uh, the head injury was terrible, and I didn't take uh, samples from her head because she was lacking half of the head. So, of course, I won't, we won't torture the animal and more than she can um, withstand. So, yeah, so this is how we sample, and um, it's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very, mu thank you very much, Sunchitsa, for your interesting lecture. Uh, we spend all the life studying pathogenic organisms, but uh, it's evident this is just the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yes. So we have absolutely changed our perspective in, in regarding organism. Um, so if there are any questions, uh, you can do also in Italian, anche in Italiano possiamo tradurre, quindi Or we can prego. do the questions in the discussion if you... Uh, as you prefer. I'm not... Uh, I'm happy maybe after the Adriana lecture, because she talks about organisms, and then uh, Delia needs a few minutes to put uh, the computer. So we can do later, as you want. Okay, thank you. So I introduce Adriana. I'm particularly happy because Adriana Trotta is uh, our PhD student of the doctorate in zoonosis and infectious disease. She is a third year, so, so she is preparing her thesis about this topic. And the lecture is uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and loggerhead sea turtles as bioindicators of pollution in Adriatic Sea. Please, Adriana. Yes, uh, thank you, Maria Laura, for your presentation, and thank you to all of you for attending this lecture. So today I want to show you the results of my research group, um, and I want to thank uh, Maria Laura, of course, about antibiotic resistant bacteria, Illogared sea turtle, and the role of this species as bioindicator, as sentinels of pollution in the Adriatic Sea. I was also tend to thank my Croatian supervisor, Professor Sunchiza Bosak. Yeah, okay, <laughs> it's perfect. Um, that is the project leader of this beautiful project, uh, the Tarto Biome Project. So the antibiotic resistance is a natural phenomenon that is mm, physiologically involved in bacteria and fungi evolution. But the onset of this phenomenon in these few years is growing faster and faster because of the incorrect use of antibiotics. For example, in clinical enteropathic infectious disease in humans or in vet disease or in agriculture. And in 2014, the World Health Organization advised that we are living a planet emergency because the Antibi antibiotic resistance and uh, especially the antimicrobial resistance, that is the resistance of bacteria against antibiotics, is reaching alarming level. And of course, this report uh, advised also that their surveillance about, uh, of IMR is not harmonized and neither coordinated worldwide. And we have still many gaps in information. So define what is the problem scope is essential in order to formulating a monitoring and everything response to HMR. HMR is antimicrobial.